Hello, everyone. Today, I am talking with Becky Simpson Ryan. Becky is a counselor. She's based in the UK. She works with a wide range of issues and people and so on, but she does have something of a niche working with neurodiversity and in particular with Tourette's syndrome. Becky has a diagnosis of Tourette's and if it's okay, that's where I'd like to begin when it comes to Tourette's. What exactly is Tourette's syndrome, Becky, for people that don't know? Well, uh, hi, Darren, nice to, nice to chat with you. Uh, so Tourette's syndrome is a neurological condition which is categorized by repeated uh, onset and uh, episodes of involuntary movements which are called tics uh, and in th there are several different tic disorders that exist but for it to be Tourette's syndrome specifically it's got a very specific uh, categorization in the DSM-5 uh, that it has to uh, start before adulthood usually typically uh, and it has to be a, a continuous pattern of repeated uh, episodes of involuntary tics. So, and I know we had talked about this briefly before. <coughs> you said this is something that may be dormant in someone, and it is triggered. It may be it, triggered by a trauma or something. Yeah, it it can be. It can certainly be triggered by a traumatic event. That that doesn't necessarily mean to say that it's caused by trauma as such. Um, if we're using myself and as, as an example. Uh, my tick symptoms didn't develop until I was 14 years old when I was going through a very traumatic time in my life. Um, but Tourette, with Tourette's syndrome, it's something you, you always have and it's something that you're born with. It's just that sometimes um, something can trigger it or, or a traumatic event can can bring on the onset of those tick symptoms. Uh, not always. Uh, sometimes it just it just develops early on of its own accord, but uh, sometimes it can be triggered by a traumatic event. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and if I can ask at that time, um, I mean, even just maybe prior to your diagnosis and even getting your diagnosis, what was that like when you, when you get a name for something, when you understand, when you get a, a term for it, what, what was that like for you? Um, I think to me, getting the official diagnosis was really helpful because it was something that I didn't understand and I didn't know what was going on with me. Uh, and it was it was actually quite scary and it was a worrying time in my life because I was having all of these symptoms that I couldn't explain and I didn't know what was going on. And I thought there was something very seriously wrong with me and I was having to have all these tests and scans and going to see a neurologist and one thing and another. Um, and when I was told it was Tourette's syndrome, I was like, oh, OK, that actually makes a lot of sense. And it makes me feel a lot better knowing that it's not just me. And there's other people out there that sort of understand what I'm going through. And, and I have something that I fit with, um, which I think is a common experience, not just across the Tourette's community, I think, but across neurodivergence in general, like getting that diagnosis um, or finding that it is something that you fit with can be really helpful for a person to make sense of it. <clears throat> when the term neurodivergence comes up a lot and some mm. people might not necessarily understand the term neurodivergence. What does neuro neurodivergence mean? So neurodivergence is basically um, an umbrella term for a, a spectrum of different uh, thinking and processing styles that exist so there can be a lot of different things that that fit in with that and obviously it's anything that's not typical or not neurotypical so we can talk about things like ADHD, autism, acquired brain injuries, Tourette's syndrome, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, all of those kinds of conditions that sort of alter the way you see the world and mm. alter the way you you think and process um mm. and and your brain function as well <clears throat> the way we interact with the world the way we communicate and so on yes absolutely yeah in in the way that we communicate with with others as well yeah so i'm wondering you know at that time you, you get your under you get your diagnosis you have your understanding and so on so now you, you have a term for it there's maybe something a little empowering in that because in the sense that you understand it a bit better what was it like when you understand the condition but maybe the people around you don't I mean even talking with strangers and so on and they don't get it they don't understand yeah I think that can be very difficult um in our community um I think there's a lot of 
misunderstanding and a lot of misconceptions about what Tourette's syndrome actually is. And, and there's a lot of people out there who still don't even know that it exists or, or, or what it even is at all. Um, so sometimes I do come up across the problem of, uh, you know, people sort of treating me differently and um, treating me like I'm strange or weird or some something that needs to be avoided <clears throat> simply because of that lack of understanding of, of what it actually is. I think it's human nature. People generally feel uncomfortable with things they don't understand. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's definitely something that I've I've found people people can shy away or or be afraid of something that they don't get or they don't understand because obviously the way Tourette syndrome presents is obviously with all of these unusual movements and noises that people aren't expecting. Um, but even not seeing someone face to face I think even if it's something that I mentioned to someone when they haven't met me face to face like if I say to them oh by the way before you meet me I have I have this thing sometimes that can make them take a step back and go oh I don't know what to expect there so I think that that's kind of what I'm about sort of um trying to educate people and, and trying to give people more knowledge and more understanding of, of what it actually is so there's not quite as much of that fear around and it it helps with the acceptance side of things and it helps it helps people to feel you know more comfortable with it i think <clears throat> comes to educating people i know you have a press <clears throat> and so on you have a youtube channel what sort of things would you be doing to try to try and normalize some of these things hmm. i mean over the last few years i've kind of uh used my various platforms to try and put out some of this education and and to make people more aware and, and to raise more awareness of Tourette's syndrome and, and to give people more perspective from someone who actually has the condition of what it actually is and to try and address some of these misconceptions. So I've, I've done some, some Q&A interviews um, and I've used I've my Twitter. I've watched a few of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> and I've, I've used my Twitter account to sort of put stuff out there in terms of education and in terms of addressing some of these misconceptions and, and answering questions that people might have. Um, and also quite recently, back in March, I, I interviewed Paul Stevenson, who's who's quite a very big figure in the Tourette's community. He's very well That's known really because he, yeah, <clears throat> he's been on the television and everything um sort of sort of asking him about his own personal experiences and sort of what would help him and, and what he finds helpful in in terms of of how other people respond to him and, and what he would expect from from therapy if he was going to therapy which <clears throat> I think would be useful for for anyone who who works in that kind of line of work to to watch and help to understand and I think that maybe it's <clears throat> approach with counseling or maybe it's just in my nature <laughs> I think whenever we're working with someone, and regard, regardless of what they're presenting with, you're working with a person, you're working with a human being. Yeah, and absolutely. You know, yeah. We start there, you know, <clears throat> working with an individual. Yeah, yeah. And I think often in our work, it's it's about meeting the person where they are, isn't it? And and trying trying to understand them and, and empathize with them from from their perspective and and that can be so important um particularly for a neurodivergent person for someone to understand their perspective of the world and and how they see things and, and how they work and how they communicate um that acceptance can make such a big difference i think <clears throat> as human beings we're hardwired for acceptance i think a, a lot of the time it's the difficulty and the fears we have with being rejected and so on because it is hardwired in us to be accepted to to belong to something to to be part of a group or or whatever it's it's just it's the human condition i think yeah it is absolutely and i think among the neurodivergent community there's a lot of experience of of not being accepted or or needing to change in some way or needing to convert to these these typical ways of being because our way of being is not normal and it's not right that's kind of the message that we get given um so i think i think fitting in and and being understood and being accepted is is something that's so important really mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier on about a bit of a niche working with neurodiversity and Tourette's is that something that you set out to do when you were training to be a therapist or is that something perhaps you fell into as is often the case sometimes with therapists 
Uh, yeah, I would say it's just something that kind of happened, really. Um, when I started training, I didn't really have any kind of specific sort of speciality that I wanted to go into. And, and my training was, was very generalised. Um, so I just assumed that's how I would be. But um, sort of once I qualified and once I started my own private practice um, and once I started building up sort of like a following and a, and a community and, and interacting with other therapists <clears throat> I actually found that there was quite a lot of other neurodivergent therapists out there mm. and um, I, I started to realize that from a client perspective actually that is what a lot of people want they want someone with that lived experience they want someone with that understanding um, and I figured yeah that it, it sounds like it's a bit of a niche it, it's what it's what a lot of people want but are finding it hard to actually find therapists with with experience I, I think particularly Tourette's um I've not actually come across another therapist or another trainee even with Tourette's syndrome so far I still seem to be the only one so I kind of figured you know if, if I put that out there as being something that I I do have a lot of knowledge about and that I do specialize in um then a lot of clients will come to me and and it does seem to have worked out that way so I think there is something in that. I remember a lecture trying to explain something uh, a long time ago where he said that you can have someone who is an expert on the Eiffel Tower. They could tell you what it's made of. They could tell you how long it took to build it, how many man hours, and they could tell you how many rivets are in it. They could tell you all of this. But there's something different than when you're talking to someone who's actually been to Paris and has been to the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely. I mean, even my own experience as a client over the years, I feel like if I'm working with someone who who gets it, mm -hmm. someone who's been through it themselves, someone who knows what I'm talking about and has had that experience, it can be so validating. It can it make make such a big difference to how you feel in the room. I think in that validation, it's it's it's. I think we sometimes need to be validated <clears throat> for the sake of feeling seen. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. not necessarily the same as being agreed with or colluded with, but to be validated is just to have someone say, "I hear how that is for you." Yeah, definitely. Uh, when you when you say feeling seen, that's that's very important, I think. And and like you say, it's not necessarily about you know completely agreeing with someone's perspective or you know com confirming everything that they're saying, but meeting them where they are, understanding their experience of the world and and what's going on for them even if it's different to how you're seeing it, it's, it's, it's still about, you know, accepting that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when it comes to neurodiversity, Tourette's, and in fact, a wide range of things, I know something we talked about before, it's never a one size fits all. There's many different levels. There's many different shades. And, you know, you'd mentioned before we, we chatted briefly about, you know, the different kinds of Tourette's. There's there's the ticks, there's the signs, there's sometimes saying something or so on. It's never a one size fits all. So it's maybe trying to understand the person where they are with it. Yes, I, I, yeah, I do think so. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very individual thing. Um, I think um, Paul Stevenson, who I interviewed before in my other video, sort of said uh, if you've met one person with Tourette's syndrome then you've met one person with Tourette's syndrome um, and that is really how it is the reality is it presents differently in everyone <clears throat> not everyone has the same symptoms or the same tics or, mm. or or even the same ways of of dealing with it and processing it. it it is a very individual thing and I think it's about accepting that and and respecting that and respecting what it is for the person and 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 what it is for them um and I think the, the biggest thing we come up against in the Tourette's community is the assumption that it is the same thing for everyone, um, but it isn't. Um, there's always kind of this this idea in people's heads, I think, of, of what it looks like, I think, which has not been helped by the media and, and TV programmes and, and how it's portrayed in that way. Um, I feel like if you say Tourette's syndrome to someone, their first automatic image is usually someone who swears all the time or someone who says really embarrassing things all the time or <coughs> or something like that. Um, but that is that is not necessarily the case. And, and actually, it's only 10 percent of people who have coprolalia, which, which is that uh, tick symptom of sort of that 
saying the aggressive and, and the swearing and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and not a lot of people know that. People seem to think that that is everyone, but that is not true. Yeah, this is the thing about the media. I think a lot of time <clears throat> talking about movies, TV shows, a lot of times they present something, they present something in the most dramatic way to try and maybe get a bit of an impact or whatever, or whatever I suppose is driving the plot. But you're right, it, it, it's like so many things. It can be multi-layered, which is why I often think of things as a spectrum. It's many different colors, many different shades, many different tones, many different levels of intensity. There's rarely a one size fits all. Yeah, definitely. And I've, I've always believed that it, when it comes to anything really, not just talking about neurodivergence specifically, I, I feel like anything that comes into my room as a therapist, I've got to see it as it's not a one size fits all situation because everyone's an individual at the end of the day <clears throat> yeah now the lecture i mentioned a moment ago, remember i'm saying when the client comes into the room the last thing you're going to be doing is giving them a list of 10 things to go and do and have a better life because that's not therapy yeah no and that, that's it, it's it's just not going to work if you try and apply that to every single person because it's not it's not going to work for everyone that's that's a simple fact of the matter and you know I could get on my soapbox about how the NHS conducts therapy and and tick box exercises and you know fitting into specific categories and one thing and another but you know we would be here forever <laughs> so <clears throat> no I, I, I would agree mm. right it's it's um well when you think of Carl Rogers I don't think it was a, a, an accident that he named his approach person-centered you know, it's about the person that's meeting the person at their point of accepting the person where they are. It's, you know, it's not handing them a list of things to do to go and be better. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, some people don't respond well to that kind of thing. And some people don't respond well to that directive kind of therapy. But you're right in what you're saying that just because that approach does work for some people doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone because everyone's an individual and it's about respecting that in the client I think and and making it about the client first it always has to be the client first doesn't it their, their experience what is important to them what matters for them and what they want to get out of the therapy if you remember you were saying about when you were younger that's when you were diagnosed what was the diagnostic process how long did that take um, well, it varies on the individual, I think, but um, I know it can be quite difficult to get an official diagnosis for Tourette's syndrome, uh, simply because there are quite a few different tic disorders and quite a, diff a few different things that it can be. Um, and obviously for me, they had to do quite a few tests. I had to go and see a neurologist. I had to have an MRI scan, one thing and another. Uh, <clears throat> went to the GP a few times. Um, they were trying to manage it with a few different things um, and none of it was working um, so it, it it did take a while um, which it can do um, but for other people it can be very easy to get a diagnosis it, it just sort of depends how it presents itself really I think. And you mentioned as well uh, before about it can co-occur with other things sometimes it can be difficult to separate things it might co-occur with things like ADHD yeah yeah it's it's actually very common for it to, for it to co-occur with with ADHD um and obviously the, the symptoms of ADHD can be very similar to Tourette's syndrome as well um so so that can often get mixed in mixed in there but there are quite a few other conditions that can co-occur with Tourette's syndrome <coughs> as well um yeah and for anybody who's watching this who has Tourette's themselves or, or knows someone who has it what sort of things would you find useful? Mm. Again, I think that's a very individual thing. I think um, how one person would manage mm. their Tourette's syndrome would be different to how another person manages it. Um, for me, um, I've tried a few different things over the years, but I think for me personally, just a mixture of like medication and sort of identifying certain things that makes the Tourette's worse, like certain triggers that, that make my tics a lot worse, uh, identifying that, yeah. I guess that was the question I was asking um, about management. <clears throat> what do you recognize maybe triggers it different in different situations? Would it be stress related? Would it be anger? Would it be what sort of things would would maybe trigger it? Yeah, I, I think 
I can't speak for everyone, but for me, definitely stress and anxiety and and that kind of thing can make the tick symptoms a lot worse. Um, but also when I'm very excited about something, you can always tell because again, I I do get um more of a more of an onset of ticks when I'm excited about something. Um, also when I'm interacting with someone else with Tourette's syndrome, sometimes you can sort of pick up on the other person's ticks and you can pass them back and forwards between each other as well. And and sometimes you can set each other off that way. So there's that. Um, um, I think sometimes people can see Tourette's ticks as something that needs to be suppressed or needs to get needs to be gotten rid of or something that needs to be managed or controlled in some way but I don't necessarily see it that way um I feel like for the individual if, it, if it's something that that they want to to keep more under control because of the detrimental effect it has on them that's fair enough because that can happen I think some people don't realize how detrimental it is to actually live with mm. um, and how physically draining it can be even I mean for me I have a specific tick that I do with my neck and and often at times I find at the end of the day I've got a really stiff or sore neck just because I've been doing that repetitive mo- movement so much um so from that from that side of things um management of the ticks themselves is is probably important but also if we're looking at it from another perspective if if we're talking about managing the things that trigger the ticks or make them worse and and identifying that um that's another way of managing it but I think the main thing sometimes is we feel like we need to suppress when we're in social situations just because of the impact it might have on others but I feel like if there was more of an acceptance and more of an understanding then that wouldn't need to be the case and I feel like people with threats would feel more comfortable just in themselves and just needing to be themselves and the ironic thing is like the more comfortable we feel and the less stressed that we feel, the less the symptoms will actually present themselves as well. Well, there is a good <clears throat> bit about being social creatures and having this need for acceptance. Mm. I think that whenever we put words like self in front of words, you know, like self-esteem, self-value, self-confidence, things like that, I think more often than not, it's not what I think of me. It's what I think others think of me. And the more conscious we are of what others think of us, sometimes, well, more again, the more self-conscious we become, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's true. I think there's a lot, lot to be said about that. Um, I saw quite a funny cartoon that said, "I've I've invented a cure for Tourette's syndrome. It's it's an, it's it's not a pill that the Tourette's syndrome sufferer takes. It's an acceptance pill for everybody else." And I, and I quite like that um, because, like you say, I, I don't think we're ever going to be able to escape the the feeling of of being judged by other people and I think you know naturally we do automatically make judgments and no matter who you are it happens so it's, it's going to be hard to escape from that but sort of the more understanding the more education and and the more these misconceptions are addressed and the, and the more of it is out there then hopefully you know across the board it, it will become a lot easier for people like me to feel accepted and, and to feel more comfortable. Becky, it's been an absolute privilege talking with you and I've learned a lot today, things that I didn't know before. I really do appreciate that. If people want to learn more about Tourette's, where can they go? How could they contact you? Where will they find you? <clears throat> well, one one sort of general place I would recommend anyone to go for, for information and education on Tourette's syndrome is Tourette's Action. Um, and um, the website for that, I think, is www.tourettes-action.org.uk, but I will double check that. Um, if, if you want to follow me specifically, I do have a Twitter account, which is at stigma in the bin. Um, I also have, well, I have you two YouTube channels, one of which only has one video at the moment, but I'm planning to put more on there and I'm, I'm planning to do some more interviews with people and stuff like that, um, which is just under my name, Becky Simpson Ryan. Um, if you want to go and watch me playing guitar and singing, I do have another YouTube channel, which again is just under my name. Um, if you if you want to check me out on my website, then it's it's www.bsimpsontherapy.com. So yeah. <clears throat> well, for what it's worth, I've been listening to you playing guitar. From someone who couldn't play the triangle, yeah, I've been listening to you playing guitar. 
<laughs> well, yeah. I've been watching, uh, I watched the interview on the other channel and it's, I, I would encourage anybody, go on to Becky's uh, channel, watch that interview, educate yourselves. It's, it's a really powerful, very honest video. I will put uh, your yeah. details in the link to this video as well so people know where to find you, okay? Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure yeah. talking to you. Hope, hopefully yeah. people get a lot out of it. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully we can maybe chat again. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. You can invite me onto your channel. Why not? Why not? <laughs> for now, take care. Bye for now. Bye.